Uh, I, I went online. So for those of you watching online, I don't know when you're watching this service, obviously. Maybe uh, as close to today as, as we're actually doing this message live. So these are headlines from our world over the last seven days. Chances are you're going to be familiar with a lot of these, right? Uh, riots in London. Have you been hearing about this? So there was a stabbing. This 17-year-old boy walked into a, a, a dance party for young girls with a knife and he just started stabbing little girls and adults and people died and there have been all these riots in London as a response because he was a foreigner and so there's this really pushback against foreigners and that's just happened in London this last week. Um, I don't know if you heard about this but there was a, a, a terrorist attack thwarted in Vienna, Austria this last week. So Taylor Swift was there to do some big concerts and three men were there with bomb making uh, materials to make bombs and slaughter people. And they caught them before the bombs went off. So who knows what we would be talking about today, right? If they hadn't caught them. Uh, there was an earthquake in Japan and I, the headline caught my attention because it said they're expecting the potential for a mega quake. I don't even know what a mega quake would look like. but. What a terrifying headline if you live in Japan. So earthquakes in Japan, uh, obviously everything that's going on with Israel and Hamas, and now it looks like other countries around there are threatening to join in the conflict against Israel, and this is just our world, right? And then of course, how many of you saw the headline about the plane crash in Brazil? 62 people died. This is just our world, right? And just some of the headlines that I could have put up here from the last week alone. And so today, all around the world, there are people who woke up and they are suffering and they are facing an uncertain future and they are scared because of either humanity's evil towards them or because of just this broken world that we live in. And you don't have to look around the world to see people in pain, do you? How many of you have people in your life who have received the news that, that's telling them how they're going to die? They know how they're going to die. They may not know when, but they know how because they've been diagnosed with this disease. How many people in your life do you know who are really struggling today with some form of mental illness? How many people do you know today in your life who are really struggling with financial needs that they know they can't meet at all? How many people do you know in your life who are trying to recover from the broken relationships in their life? Right. And into this world that we live in with so much pain and suffering, it can get really confusing to endure these things over and over again, right? I was reading a story years ago about a woman who was a survivor of one of our, our, our country's mass shootings. She survived it. She survived by hiding under a bed but there were plenty of people around her who didn't survive. And she came out and she said this. She said, what in the world was God doing? She said, I get he doesn't stop everything. I get that sometimes I get a flat tire and sometimes my car breaks down, but he should have seen this. Have you ever at any moment in your life had the same kind of feeling? Like, what in the world, God? What in the world are you doing? You ever been standing next to someone when they asked the question? Super painful, right? It is the number one reason I've watched people walk away from God, is asking that question and not being able to have some kind of answer. The number one reason why people walk away from God is suffering and pain in this world. It is the number one question I've been asked in 34 years of doing this job. Number one question repeatedly asked, if God is good and God is powerful, why is there so much suffering and evil in this world today? Why? So it's been a while since I addressed uh, topics like this, and so we're gonna start a brand new series today called Doubting God. And for many people, that accurately describes where they're at right now spiritually, right? In our country, you have, you have friends right now that doubt God, right? Family members that doubt God. Some of you may have all kinds of big questions about God in your own mind. So we're going to tackle some big topics in this series. And we're going to start with this one. If God is good and he's powerful, then why 
has he allowed a world with so much suffering and evil in it? So I want to ask you to open up your program, take out the notes that you'll find inside. Please grab a pen. There'll be some things you might want to write down today. And if, well, of course, welcome to all of you who are watching online. So glad that you're watching today. If you want to get your notes, or get these notes as well, you can go to our website at penualchurchlife.com and you can download them as well. Uh, and we're going to jump right into this. And there are four major theories that exist in this world to try and make sense of all the suffering and evil that we see all around us. So these are the four theories. Theory number one is that God just doesn't exist, right? That's, the, that's about 10% of America uh, are atheists, about 10%. It never really goes up or down much from that number. It just stays right around that number. So about 10% believe, yep, that's the reason. There is no God, there's no God. And again, like I told you, the number one reason why people see people walk away from their faith is because of the suffering that they've, exist, they've, they've endured in their life. I was reading on a website this last week, and it was atheists talking about the day they stopped believing. Here's some of the stories. One, one man said, I never doubted in God until my grandma was diagnosed with vascular dementia and Alzheimer's. She was about 60. When she died, my mom said, that she would be singing with the angels. But I couldn't understand why a loving God would have taken her voice away in the first place. And he said, that's the day he stopped believing in God. Another woman wrote on the website and said, I felt like I was put here on earth to be a mom. But then I was told I have unexplained infertility. And that was the day I stopped believing in God. A lot of people with stories similar to that. This man's name is Richard Dawkins. He is a very famous, outspoken atheist. He said, the universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at the bottom. No design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference because there is no God. That's the good news for the day. There we go, right? This a pitiless, indifferent universe that you live in. Wow. So there are people in, in your life that believe this. Maybe some of you struggle with this or have at some point in your life really wrestled with the question of, is there really even a God? It's an important question to wrestle with. It's going to be one of the topics we cover in this series. What's the evidence that points in the direction of believing in rational, rational belief in, a, in the existence of a God anyway? So... Not today, but we're going to cover it. So some people fall into this camp. They're like, the reason there's so much suffering evil, there is no God. Okay. Second one that people fall into is this one. God exists, but not like the Bible says. Because the Bible describes him as those two things, both all-powerful and completely loving. Matter of fact, when describing God, it doesn't just say that God is loving, although he is. It says that God is love. He is love. And the loving behavior just flows out who he is. So you look at the messed up world that we live in and you're like, uh, those two things can't be true, right? And so in the history of mankind, there have been plenty of religions that have come along and said one of those is true, but not both of them is true. We believe in a God or gods, but they both can't be true. So you look back and you know your Greek mythology at all? Do you know your Greek mythology at all? So, you know, they were powerful beings, right? and completely didn't care about human beings. Human beings were there to be used. So Zeus could wake up with a bad hair day and start zapping the earth with lightning bolts and people die because he just doesn't care. But he's powerful. And this is what the ancient world worshiped was the powerful beings who just don't care about us. It was their attempt to make sense of the suffering and evil of this world. They didn't reject the idea of a God or gods in their case. They believed in gods. They just thought they just don't care about us. And so that was their attempt to explain the suffering and evil of the world. But that one isn't as common anymore. Instead, there are a lot of people who, who go the other way and they say, oh, no, 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 he does care. He's just not capable of restraining all the evil of this world anymore. So it's the power of God that they question. This man wrote a book that became a, a number one bestseller when bad things happen to good people. And he watched his son die this long, slow death from a progressive illness and part of what, he, what emerged in his belief were these thoughts. Even God has a hard time keeping chaos in check. So he wants to because he loves us so, so much, but he just can't keep up with all of it. 
God is a God of justice, he said, but not of power. How many of you want to worship a God like that? He's loving, but he's just not powerful. There's like an elderly man sitting in a rocking chair somewhere in the edge of the universe, rocking back and forth, saying, boy, I wish I could do something about that. How many of you want to worship that God? Just not powerful. But there are people who believe these. God exists, just not like the Bible says. Third theory that people go to all the time is this one. God stepped away a long time ago. Matter of fact, in the, I don't know, 90s or 80s, they all blurs together. There was a song, very famous song, that God is watching us from a distance. Remember the song? Some of you do. Look it up. God is watching us from a distance. He's far away, made everything, but now he's just way off in the distance somewhere on the outer edges of the universe watching what's happening down here on planet Earth. And, but that raises all kinds of questions. How can he do that and ignore what's happening on the planet that he created? Right? Because here's what's happening. Here's what happened this last week. This in uh, Southern Maryland is, the, uh, is a baseball stadium for a minor league baseball team. Never heard of it but it made the news this last week because they were hosting this last week a baseball game. And like many of these minor league teams do, to, in order to attract crowds, they came up with this fun little event. They put out all these things for kids, like a bouncy house. And they put the bouncy house up on this upper elevated section inside their stadium, and they didn't fasten the bouncy house down. And a five-year-old had gone to the game with his mom and dad and was bouncing in the bouncy house when a gust of wind picked it up and threw it over the side, and he died. And God is watching us from a distance? Then clearly he's not good, right? Because how can he be at a distance watching this kind of trauma happen and do absolutely nothing? This is what's happening every single day all around the world, constantly. So how can he, how can he be watching this? And plus, it doesn't even explain why is there evil and suffering in the world to begin with? Because it, it, one of the things we're going to cover in this series is just how finely tuned the universe is for life to exist anywhere. The mathematical possibility that life should exist or could exist anywhere in the university is absolutely mind-boggling. Some of the numbers that we're gonna talk about are just absolutely beyond belief. And yet, here we are, here we are. So it's fine-tuned to a degree that allows life to exist. So obviously, you're talking about a stunningly smart and powerful being that can do all this, and then he gets to planet Earth and he makes it, and it's so screwed up that we've got earthquakes and volcanoes and hurricanes and tornadoes. It's like, what happened? Did you just get tired and say, well, that's good enough for now, and walk away? Why would you do that? You're clearly smart and powerful. You can create this entire universe for life to exist, and then you just walk away, and are you done with it? So it just doesn't make any sense. So what's going on? Well, thankfully, these are not our only theories. There's another theory that the Bible, um, that many, many people call the God and choice theory. The God and choice theory. And the... The basis for this theory is found in the very first book of your Bible called Genesis. And in the book of Genesis, in the early chapters of Genesis, it lays out our beliefs on how suffering and evil came into being in this world. How did this all happen? There are four steps in this, in this uh, process. First, God created a perfect world and perfect humans without evil and without suffering. And here's how it describes it in the early chapters of Genesis. It says, God created people in his own image, and then God looked over all he had made, and he saw that it was excellent in every way. How many of you look around at the world today and say, oh, it's excellent in every way, right? Not what we see, but that's not what he made. What he made was excellent in every way. There, in that world, there were no alarm clocks, didn't need them. And no political commercials ever, right? Isn't that amazing? Doesn't that sound a little like Eden? It's like, oh, take us back to Eden, Jesus, please, right? So it was a perfect world, perfect world. Not what we see. And step number two, God created humans with the freedom to choose between enjoying a relationship with him or rejecting him. And here's how the, the choice was set up. Look at this. 
The Lord God gave him this warning. You may freely eat any fruit in the garden except fruit from the tree, the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat of its fruit, you will surely die. So what we're talking about, of course, is what, the, what we all call today free will. God created human beings with free will. Free will is just this idea that I freely have the choice right now what I choose to do, right? I can choose to walk off this little platform, walk up to any of you and punch you right now, or I can choose to stay in here and keep talking. I have free will. I can choose what I do in the next moment of my life. And God created human beings with free will, with the hope that they would choose to love and obey him, but I also have the freedom to choose something different, don't I? I can choose to love and obey, or I can choose not to. And God created human beings with this free will. And unfortunately, we all know, oh, and by the way, the free will decision is amazing. He put them in a planet that had a billion things they could do. Like Disney World times a billion. And then said, there's only one thing you can't do. See that tree? Don't touch it. So somebody once asked me, why did he even do that? Why put the tree in there? Why put one thing? You have a billion things you can do, just one thing you can't do. Why? Because what makes love amazing is the choice. Do you remember what it was like when you were in love with someone and the first day you took that risk and you told them? You're like, I, maybe you put it in a note or a text and you're like, I love you. And then how did you feel, right? You were waiting with like, what are they going to say? Did I go too fast? Do they not feel the same? And then how did you feel when they said, I love you too? Like, wow, right? Because that's the wow. It's the choice that someone makes to love you. That's what makes love amazing. And so if you strip away the choice and you put them in a perfect place where there is no way they can choose not to love you, then there's no love. Because love has to have the choice to say yes or to say no. That's what makes love so powerful is we make the choice. And so he gave them a, a world in which they could do anything they wanted and only one thing that they shouldn't do. And what do human beings do, right? Humanity freely chose to turn away from God. Freely chose it. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. So we have an incredible paradise on earth. We do anything we want, just one thing we can't do. It's literally, you know this is human nature, right? Put up a sign that says, do not touch on anything. What will humans want to do? Touch it immediately. It's human nature. It's like, ugh. So we did. And the fourth step was evil and suffering entered the world as a result of our choice. And it affected everything. The first thing it affected was the connection between us and God. And this is what people feel so deeply today. The sense of missing something, right? Something is missing from my life. And so what do we do as Americans? We chase everything. I need more money because more money will satisfy me. I need more success. I need more pleasure. I need more sex. I need more, 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 more. And how is it working? We're all just so content. We're the richest nation that's ever existed. And we are so content and happy, right? Of course not. We're absolutely miserable and growing in our mental illness by leaps and bounds because no thing on earth can satisfy the deepest longings of your soul because you weren't created for connection with a thing. You were created by a God, headed towards a God for a relationship with a God. And he's the only thing that can satisfy our souls. But we keep thinking, no, we'll find it out there. I'm sure you will. And that separation was the first thing that happened. We could not be in the deep connection with God and friendship that he wanted for us. And the world around us broke earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, all the natural disasters. But more than that, the evil of man towards man and humanity began. D genetic disease, all of this began. It was never the world God created. The world broke. Now, some people immediately at this point go, wait a second, time out, Brian. This seems unfair to me. Why am I still having the consequences for what other people chose? It is the most natural question. Great question. Put a pin in that. I'm going to come back to it, okay? I'll cover it in just a minute. But the next question that people ask immediately is, okay, then why doesn't he do something about it now? Flip your notes over on the back and look at the back of your notes. So why doesn't he do something about it now? 
So the, if this is real and this is actual, then why doesn't he say, so let's consider his options. Option number one, God could destroy us all and start over, right? Option, he could. He is God. He could simply do something like remove the force of gravity and out we go into outer space and it's all gone. We start all over. He could remove oxygen from the planet, couldn't he? a snap of his fingers, he could take oxygen away. We all die. He could start all over. I'm not in favor of plan A, okay? Not in favor of this one. Option number two, he could just get rid of all the evil people. And this is what everyone talks about. Get rid of the drunk driver. Get rid of the serial killer. Get rid of them. Just kill them, God. Take them out. Let them have the accident and hurt themselves alone. This is what everybody wants. There's a problem with this one, too. Um, One of my (laughs) years and years ago, when I was young, I I wanted to challenge myself to read a bigger book that was kind of outside my comfort zone. And I read, I went online and I found a book called The Archipelago Gulag by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. And it was a Pulitzer Prize winning book. And I thought, I'm just going to read something way outside my comfort zone. He was a Christian. I didn't know what I was reading. It was brilliant. It was about how he suffered during Stalin's regime of terror in Russia. It was amazing. But there was a comment in the book that blew me away. He said this, if only there were evil people somewhere, it was necessary only to separate them from the rest of us, and then we just destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who's willing to destroy peace of his own heart? I I still remember how much that quote impacted me the moment I read it. The capacity for human, for evil, is is a human universal. How many of you saw the movie Oppenheimer recently, a big popular movie that came out not that long ago? Robert Oppenheimer, in real life, I don't know if he said in the movie, I haven't seen the movie, but in real life, he said this, when we deny the evil within ourselves, we dehumanize ourselves and we deprive ourselves of any possibility of dealing with the evil of others. So if God's just gonna wipe out the evil people, that means all of us go, we're back to option one, and I've already said I'm not in favor of option one. And some people really struggle with this word evil. Do you know evil, I read this great definition this week, evil is the absence of love. Now do you struggle with the word? Are you seriously pretending like you've only been loving every moment of every day of your life? Of course not. And and on on top of this, if God was going to get rid of all the evil people, there's another problem. Do you know who this is? You recognize that little boy? Oh, yeah, somebody knew it, yeah. It's Adolf Hitler. So this is how you historically remember him, right? A man who was responsible for the slaughter of six million Jews and tens of millions of people. I was watching a doctor documentary on Netflix recently. It was just amazing. So much pain and suffering caused by this man. So let's say that God, outside of time, because God isn't limited by time, he sees Adolf Hitler born, he sees with the end, he sees what's going to happen, and he's like, no chance, I'm taking this kid out. And so he lets Adolf Hitler as a young boy get smallpox and die. How does his family respond? Do they say, oh God, thank you so much for killing our son? Is that how they respond? What, do, what does his family and all of the community say to God at the funeral of this little boy? Curse you, God, right? You are a terrible God. You don't know anything. You don't know what you're doing. Curse you, right? That's what they say. Because we fundamentally don't trust God in this world. And yet, only from our perspective would we know, you know, only through time would we know that God just did an amazing thing if he had taken him out. God cannot win on this one. He cannot win. Third thing you could do is override every evil act. (laughs) You know, how many of you grew up watching Roadrunner and things like this, right? So you can do that. What's about to happen to Wiley Coyote when he pushes that plunger down, right? What's, What's about to happen to him? Do you remember this? You all know if you watch this old cartoons, that's what's gonna happen to Wiley Coyote. Now, is he gonna die? 
Would we die? Oh, absolutely. But he doesn't die. He doesn't die when, he, when that goes off. He doesn't die when this happens. Nothing kills him. He holds up a little sign and goes, ouch, and he gets back up, and his fur is fine, his body's fine, he just keeps going. So God could have created a fake world like that where we have no consequences. Obviously, he didn't do that, and it's silly and laughable and funny to talk about, but it's not real life. And I do believe, by the way, that God does more to override evil in this world than we ever find out about. Like, we just caught those terrorists in Austria. I believe God does more things like that than we will ever, 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 ever know until heaven. But he clearly doesn't stop at all, does he? So he could reprogram us. He has this power. Since the problem is free will, he could take out our free will. He could do this. He could just take it away from us. With one, it's just like, you know, like a scientist reprogramming a robot, he could do that. He could take free will out of us. Just eliminate it. Matter of fact, when people hear this, they're like, well, then why did he even create us with free will in the first place? And let me just reiterate this. C.S. Lewis put it this way. C.S. Lewis said, free will is what has made evil possible. That is the, that's true. The moment he gave us free will, we had the ability to choose to love and obey or to walk away. We had the ability to choose loving people or hurting people. Every minute of our lives, we always have this choice. He made that. So why did he give us free will? Because free will though it makes evil possible, is also the only thing that makes possible any love or goodness or joy worth having. We wouldn't have any of those things without free will. It was the risk God knowingly took. So he could reprogram us, but again, it's then back to the fake world and not at all what we want. And the, let, me, let me go back to the question I asked earlier. Okay, if this is all true, why then why am I still held accountable for what other people chose so long ago? So you have a choice every day, right? You have free will. You could get up and walk out right now. You could turn this off if you're watching. You just turn it off right now. You have free will. Yeah, if you're not watching, you already turned it off. So yeah, uh, you, you have a choice. You have free will. And in the choices of our lifetime, we have made a lot of choices outside of the arena of love in our lifetime. In other words, it's easy to look at them and blame them and say we're all in this mess because of what they did. And the reality is we're in, the problem in this world isn't that I live in a broken and fallen world. The problem in this world is that I myself am broken and fallen. That's the problem. I've simply continued every single day the decision that they made all those years ago. I've just continued it. That's why I love there's this evangelist who talks about this all the time, and I've shown some videos of him, and he uses the Ten Commandments, this basic moral code that at some point in your life you probably all heard. And he asks questions for people who are exploring God and think that they're okay with God, because this is the fundamental thing. So many Americans, so many people around the world just think, I'm fine, God's fine with me. There's, I don't really need Jesus. Jesus is like a heated steering wheel in a car, right? You can have a car without it and you'll be just fine, but boy, it's like a little nice thing if I can have it, right? But it's not really essential. Rather than understanding that Jesus is oxygen and we don't live without him. And that fundamental misunderstanding of the fact that I absolutely need every moment of my life Jesus is what makes Jesus kind of this optional thing that so many pe people treat as optional in their lives because we don't understand what Jesus came to reveal and what he came to do. So let me show you again. I've shown you some videos from this guy in the past talking about just the Ten Commandments of people on the street. Take a look at this. You think you're a good person. I'm going to try and change your mind. I'm going to do it respectfully mm -hmm. by using the Ten Commandments. How many lies have you told in your life? I would have no idea. A few? Of course. <laughs> so what do you call someone who tells lies? A sinner. A liar. A liar. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Absolutely. Would you use your mother's name as a cuss word? No. That would be a horrible thing to yeah. do. It would dishonor her horribly. To take her name and use it in the place of a four-letter filth word beginning with S to express disgust? 
And yet, that, and yet that's what you've done with the holy name of God, which God the Jews won't even speak. They won't even write it down. Right. It's called blasphemy. It's so serious. It's punishable by death in the Old Testament. Now, Jesus said, if you look at a woman and lust for her, you commit adultery with her in your heart. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? Yes. So, Eric, I'm not judging you, but you've just told me you're a lying, blasphemous, fornicating adulterer at heart who's self-righteous, and you have to face God on Judgment Day. If he judges you by the Ten Commandments, we've looked at four, you're going to be innocent or guilty? Guilty. Heaven or hell? <laughs> yeah. As of this point, yeah, hell. Does that concern you? It does, yeah. Like you said, four of the Ten Commandments. Well, actually, three. I cut one of the clips out. Three of the Ten Commandments. How many of us, if we just look at just a few of those commandments, would say, yep, never told a lie. Never had lust in my heart. Never taken God's name in vain. We stand convicted and guilty in front of this holy and pure God of love. And so the reality is I have continued the very decision that caused this chaos in the world. And the problem in the world is that I'm broken and fallen. And about that, God has done the unthinkable. God chose to pay for our evil actions so we could be forgiven and have the opportunity for a relationship with him. And he did it in an unbelievable way. He sent his son into the world 2,000 years ago to become one of his own creations, knowing that the end of his time on earth was this, where he would allow his own creation to nail him to a cross so that he could pay for us. Look at what it says. God made Christ, who never sinned, Jesus never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could, look at this phrase, be made right with God through Christ. That's the offer. That's why Jesus isn't optional. He's essential because he's offering human beings the opportunity to start over with God. Remember the first consequence of all this is the broken and separation between us and God? That can be renewed today through Jesus Christ. Let me have you bow your heads as we finish up today. Maybe today this is the first time this has really made sense to you. Why, the, why we need Jesus. If God were to evaluate you by his moral law, he would see that we have all fallen short. That we all need him. So maybe today this is the day when it's time to put your trust in him. To let Jesus Christ begin to do the work inside of you that he wants to do to fix the brokenness that exists within all of us. If you're ready for that with your head bowed and your eyes closed, you can say something like this in your heart to him. You can say, Jesus, I'm turning to you today. I need you. I know that I have acted in ways that were not loving my whole life. I've been selfish and unkind and I have brought damage into this world. But I heard today that you died on that cross for me. So please forgive me. I'm turning my life over to you today. I want you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this service today. We hope as a church and pray that this was something that really helps connect you deeper to Jesus. That's what we're all about as a church. If you need to communicate with us, uh, if you go online to penielchurchlife.com, in the upper right-hand corner is a box that says, I said yes to Jesus. It also says, please pray for me. Just click on that, and it'll take you to a place where you can communicate with us as a church. So if, if you ever want any of the resources we mentioned in a service, go there and let us know. We'll gladly send them to you. Or if you made a decision to say yes to Jesus or you have a prayer request, just let us know. And we're always glad to hear from the people who are watching online. And if we can continue to help you grow in your faith in any way, then we want to do that. So again, thank you. And our prayer is that you continue to grow and connect and find the true life that Jesus Christ is offering.